Before I get to his new and enthralling biography of the first half of his career, I'm going to ask him unexpectedly to read one of my favorite poems in here, The Owl and the Pussycat by Edward Lear. And I want to ask you to share with our friends here why this poem is one of your favorites. Well, it's a, it's a poem for young people, and I first experienced it as a little boy. And uh, I just included it because I think very often poetry has that effect. It sort of evokes child, childhood responses, childlike responses. I, if I read it, you'll, I'm sure it'll affect everybody the same way. It's, you say it's one of, the most, one of the most fun poems to read of all, right? Yeah, and it's very dreamlike. I mean, it, it, such a thing could only happen in a dream, of course, an owl and a pussy cat setting off to sea. Uh, so it's like, a, it's like a dream poem. It's almost like a Maurice Sendak. All right, I'll read it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> the owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea-green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five-pound note. The owl looked up to the stars above and sang to a small guitar, Oh, lovely pussy. Oh, pussy, my love, what a beautiful pussy you are, you are, you are. What a beautiful pussy you are. Pussy said to the owl, you elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Oh, let us be married, too long we have tarried, but what shall we do for a ring? What does that say about acting? That you can bring powerful and sincere emotions out of what is not real. Well, it's not just acting, but writing. It's, uh, I mean, I think the richest drama, the richest uh, performance, the richest interaction between a performance and an act and an audience is very complex. It's suffused with all kinds of feeling. There's another great moment of Shakespeare where everybody Shries and moans and keens about the death of Juliet when she's not dead. Again, it's a total travesty of Greek, uh, of Greek tragedy because she's not dead. Uh, and the audience knows that. The audience knows something that the performers don't know. And it's a little insight into kind of the absurdity of life, the sort of deep emotional absurdity, emotional and comical absurdity of life. But it's not merely the words, is it? There's something else going on that the actor plays upon. Yeah, well, that's the actor's job, to sort of channel the, to channel the writing or channel the, the situation. When did you know it was going to be your job? Well, I, I grew up in a theater family, as I describe in the book. Uh, I didn't want to go into the family business, even though I loved the theater. I loved the magic of the theater and uh, the, the sort of beautiful world that my father had created in creating Shakespeare festivals. But I, 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 it was not my intention to be an actor. Do you still hear Shakespeare in your father's voice? What a, what a lovely question. I, I, I do. In fact, I have... I have heard there are a couple of little scraps of recording tape that capture him from like the early 1950s when he was a much younger man than I, performing Brutus uh, in High Tragedy and Dr. Caius in Low Farce in The Merry Wives of Windsor. And it's unbelievably stirring for me to hear that. He had a very kind of stentorian, grand and old-fashioned way of performing Shakespeare. A lot of it came from the fact that he and his companies acted Shakespeare out of doors with no amplification. So it was, you know, once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more. It was literally yelled. They had to yell everything the way the Greeks had to yell and yet give it some substance of humanity. So it was big and stentorian. And I became a little kind of uh, snotty about it when I became an actor myself. I began to feel my father was a very old-fashioned actor, and I was, I was more of the new, the, the sort of new age. Uh, 
on, I was such a young asshole. Well, well he was a... <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, you grew out of it. <laughs> yes, Listen to me now. <laughs> Take us to that moment when he's failing, he's frail, he's given up, he's ready to die, and then something happens that brings the mystic chord of memory. Snap alive again, right? That's just what happened. Uh, he was a great Shakespearean, a great man of the theater, and he had a huge, genial nature. He was very generous-hearted and had a great sense of humor. And when he was 86 years old, uh, he'd had an operation, he was very ill, and he was very depressed. He became a different person. And to all appearances, he'd lost the will to live. And I found myself in a situation where I was taking care of him and my mom for a whole month, trying to work out some sort of care for him in this, at the moment of this crisis. And I, I knew my big job was to simply cheer him up, get him going again, and nothing worked. And I had the bright idea about halfway through my time with them to read them bedtime stories. There was this big fat book called Tellers of Tales that he had used to read us stories when we were all little children. Well, I looked through their bookcases and I found that book. And that evening when they were all tucked into bed, I showed them the book, just like little children, told them to pick a story, the way we did. And the story he picked was Uncle Fred Flits By by P.G. Woodhouse, which I recognized immediately and remembered it was one of our favorite stories, but I'd totally forgotten it. So read these two paragraphs. Uh -huh. You're so smart, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> so I read it to them. I launched into the first paragraph, this is Uncle Fred Flits By, with only the dimmest memory of what I was reading. As the story unfolded, more and more of it came back to me. I was astonished. It was hysterical. I'd never read anything like it. It practically caught fire in my hands. The characters revealed themselves and the complications kicked in. And one by one, I recognized all those moments that we had thought were so damn funny all those years ago. And then it happened. My father started to laugh. It was a helpless, gurgly laugh, almost in spite of himself. It was like the engine of an old car starting up after years of disuse. I kept reading and he kept laughing harder and harder until he was almost out of breath. It was the most wonderful sound I'd ever heard. And I'm convinced that it was some time during the telling of that story that my father came back to life. They dined on mints and slices of quince, which they ate with a runcible spoon. And hand in hand on the edge of the sand, they danced by the light of the moon, the moon, the moon. They danced by the light of the moon. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs>